We come to women's football. A, a remarkable season in many ways for our Manchester City's women's team. Started off quite poorly, uh, with languishing mid-table, and then went on a run of, I think, 13 wins that captured the League Cup, got to an FA Cup final, qualified for the Champions League next season. That was quite a, t quite a turnaround and, and quite a compliment to, to the people running that, that team within the business, that they, they turned it around so well. Well, it was a, it was a season of two halves. And, uh, and the first half, uh, certainly I think they had a lot of injuries. They had a lot of challenges that the, the team had to deal with and weather through. But I think they finished off uh, very well. The second half of the season was, was tremendous. And it's, um, I think, big credit to the coaching staff, the players. Uh, our women's team continues to be a very competitive, high-quality team that goes you know, year in, year out. Uh, competitive, high quality, high standards. And you know, I think if you look at the women's game, the way it's evolving, not just in England, but I think all over the world, it is certainly uh, growing from strength to strength. You look at attendance, some of the attendance figures since the World Cup, and, and particularly you look at some of the games this year. So the women's game, I think more than ever, is, is, is coming together, it's coming strong, its popularity is growing, and it you know, confirms uh, our convictions from the beginning of why we decided as a group to invest in the women's game and uh, how we've continuously backed it uh, because it's, it's, it comes with a, with a belief and a conviction that the women's game will be uh, part of uh, you know, the, the future of, of football in a, in a very, very real way. We don't look at this as uh, women's football or men's football or youth football. We look at this at, as football and, uh, and football as a sport. Uh, in all its aspects, uh, is, is, is a growing uh, sport that, that we see in a very uh, positive way going forward. I mean, we're talking about Manchester City women, and we say goodbye to, we talked about the legends of Fernandinho, we say goodbye to, but on the women's side in Manchester, Karen Bardsley and Jill Scott have both left the club, um, and, and in their ways have been equally important for the women's team as Fernandinho was to the men. They are indeed. I think both Karen and Jill have uh, given immense contribution to our women's team over the years from the beginning. Uh, they are considered uh, legends in this you know, young history of our women's team. So it's a um, big loss for us, but we, you know, we thank them for all they, what they've given uh, to the women's game uh, and to Manchester City's women's team and wish them all the best in the future and, uh, you know, they will always have a place with us and, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to always uh, remember them uh, in, in the way that they've performed so uniquely for this club. If I can go off the pitch for a while and, and turn the clock back. The pandemic struck the world. It, it, it hit football as hard as any other business. Um, you, you said to me a year ago we were taking a two-year view of trying to get the finances and, the, and, and income back in, in line. How, how, is it, how has that gone? How, how has the club fared over the last two years financially? We've done, um, we've done very well. In the sense that COVID was an anomaly, a very challenging uh, uh, black swan event that put an incredible challenge on the whole world. Uh, from a personal perspective, but obviously also from a personal, from a professional perspective, I think anyone you're speaking to in, in the world would have, would have talked about that. When we looked at how the pandemic is going to affect football and, and what is the impact it's going to have on football in general, the Premier League, and then obviously uh, Manchester City, yeah, I mean, it was, it was very difficult. Uh, we had to um, manage through and weather through a lot of challenges. Uh, losing obviously the revenue from match day uh, for long periods had, a, had an impact. But from day one, I would say my uh, vision, my direction was uh, to the team and to the, to the organization was we have to work towards ensuring that we weather through the storm and that we come out stronger. And um, I think I'm, I'm delighted to say that we've weathered through it and we have come out stronger.
Today, I think our revenue, you've seen the figures uh, for last year, 19% uh, up year on year. Of course, uh, broadcasting revenue has been improved with us winning the league last year and making uh, the Champions League uh, final. But also, I think on, uh, on the commercial side, we've done some great things, great new partners uh, all over the world. I expect us to continue to grow and go from strength to strength. And, um, you know, the, the pandemic is uh, hopefully now behind us. I can see you're excited by the new shirt. I know your, your young daughter's been wearing one uh, <laughs> just this week. So it's, it's captured the public imagination because it's got that nod to the past and the great city player of the past, Colin Bell, who's commemorated within the shirt. But it's a, it's a beautiful shirt. I mean, how do you compare it to... Um, to other shirts, I mean, maybe that's not fair, but... Um. No, you know, one, one of the best things, one of the things I enjoy most about this job is that decision, final decision making on the kits. You know, there's many things about this that you like and you know, some things you enjoy, some things you don't, but believe me, that part I really enjoy. Over the last 14 years, you know, dealing, uh, you know, when the teams come with the final recommendations on, uh, on, on the kits, uh, it's really something I really look forward uh, towards. But I will say, with Puma, they have been uh, uh, quite, quite uh, incredible in the way they've approached uh, each season, each kit. Uh, and you look at what they've done with this particular kit, I assure you, when they showed it to me the, for the first time, I knew this was going to be a home run. Um, it's um, the history that this brings back, uh, the colors, uh, the crest back in the center, um, the homage to, you know, the 60s and 70s, and of course, um, Colin Bell. At this time, uh, the timing, uh, and having that, you know, special connection to, uh, to the king, um, I knew it. This was going to be uh, a, a big hit, and, and, and clearly now, we all know right now it's gonna, it's, 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 it is the best kit we've ever, we've ever had from a, from a sales perspective. So recently we've unveiled a statue of Sergio Aguero to stand alongside those of Vincent Company and David Silver in front of the East Stand. But I think uh, you might have some more news for City fans about other plans for statues. Yes, of course. So over the, the last couple of years, we've had the statues of Vincent Company, David Silver, and Sergio Aguero, and, and these, these three uh, represented the most successful era in the history uh, of, of this club. But there are other very successful eras, and I, th and I think uh, remembering uh, Colin Bell, Francis Lee, Mike Somerby is very important. Uh, this club has a, has a great history. Uh, these are players that have contributed, contributed immensely to this, to this club and, and have earned uh, I think the fans can all uh, agree with me on this, uh, have earned the right uh, to be uh, appreciated uh, for forever, eternally, uh, with, with statues. So we've commissioned, uh, we've started the work now commissioning uh, a work that I think, I won't say too much right now until it's, it's done, but what I will say is these three legends will be properly respected and, and represented with a work of art that all the fans of this club will, will be able to, uh, to see. This summer also includes a, a trip to the United States. Summer tours are back on, two iconic sporting venues await. How important is that and how excited are you by that? Well, it's great after three years of COVID to go back to some form of no normality. The, the human interaction of going back and, and having a proper preseason uh, the ability to have a preseason without any other uh, competition, so really having the whole group together, I think is a great opportunity. Going back to the United States, obviously one of the most important markets uh, in the world, uh, a market or a place that has uh, you know, a huge Manchester City fan base. Uh, I know Pep and the team are really excited about going back, having a proper preseason, interacting with the fans, uh, being in, and playing in two of the most iconic stadiums in the United States, a lot of history that comes with that. But also, I think, you know, just talking about the interactive side of it, it's amazing what's happened on the, on the social media side of it, uh, of, of the club. Really, uh, if you look at year on year, 
uh, our fan base, our um, uh, followers, um, the, the level of activity we're having between the club, the fans, the interactions has gone up. It shows you, I think, we are going in the right direction. Uh, and I think the content that's coming out of this club is, uh, is great content that we're getting in immense interface. Uh, with our fans and our supporters all over the world. So we talked about Manchester City a lot, but the group's CFG is becoming huge. And at one point last year, I think Manchester, Melbourne, Mumbai, New York were all champions in their country. I mean, if that's not proof positive of the way the group is set up, I don't know what is. New York City had one of the most exciting seasons of, uh, in MLS. Um, and then this year, you know, we are, you know, close to the top, and we continue to go from strength to strength uh, in that in that in that league. Uh, in Australia, uh, we've done the same, similar league, similar league structure, similar constraints, and uh, again, as an organization, we were able to put a wonderful team together. Uh, we won the league last year, and we're, we're there again. And uh, in India. Again, similar system. We, we, Mumbai City won the league for the first time, and uh, we're delighted with uh, with that team and delighted with how, in a very short span, we were able to uh, support that team uh, to get it to win the league uh, for the first time in its history. So you know, but the success is is, is also across the board. I mean, you look at um, uh, the success with Trois, uh, Trois going from the second division in France to Ligue 1. And then this year, uh, again, staying in Liga uh, and over the year, over the whole season, being very competitive, and that was really the, the target of of, uh, of uh, Trois. You know, first target was to go to Liga, and then second target was to stay and be competitive within Liga, and they've done that. Um, so you see that, and you see that in every team that we uh, we are part of, um, we have strong management, we have good coaching, great coaching. And we have uh, results uh, that reflect, uh, I think, the way this group is, is being managed, uh, not just in Manchester, but everywhere around the world. And our attention, while yes, of course, Manchester City being, being the, the biggest club in the group gets a lot of the attention, uh, but I assure you, every other club within this group gets the, the attention it deserves, and, uh, and we're seeing the success both um, East uh, and West. In New York in particular, a club that was only formed, what, eight years ago, has only been playing for six years, I think. I mean, that's, that is quite a remarkable achievement. And I know it's a thorny subject with the fans there, but without a stadium of their own as well, so. Yeah, I mean, in, in New York is, uh, is, a, is a, I, I love the, the story of our uh, involvement in MLS, because there, literally, we started from scratch, from, from absolute scratch, there was no team. So to build that team, to build that franchise, uh, and then over the years um, build an organization and then win in MLS, which is very competitive. And for the, for the people who work in New York City, those that have been there, the non-football stuff, I mean, it's amazing for them as well. I mean, you know, it's the footballers, yes, and the, and the managers that have spent their whole life winning things, losing things, but for that staff to take not necessarily a gamble, but to you know come into something so new that must be fantastic for them as well. We have a great uh, group of individuals that, that that are part of this club uh, in every aspect, and um, and I think the way the city has embraced football, soccer, as they call it in the United States, how they've embraced this team. Uh, let's not forget this is the only team in New York that has won its won its respective competition uh, last year, and in New York is one of the greatest cities in the world. It has uh, teams in every comp American competition, and, and not just one, two, uh, in the case of football or basketball or, uh, or baseball uh, or hockey. So it's a, it's a sports city and with great uh, teams. But this new franchise in New York that is you know, seven years old is now coming up and becoming you know, an integral part of, of the city and of, of the community in New York. And, uh, and I love the way this, this team is evolving. And you mentioned Estac Trois. I've got to get yeah. the pronunciation correct. You say it much better than I do. <laughs> I mean, they had some fantastic results. They held PSG, I think, in one game, and they beat Lille 3-0 to 
the reigning champions to guarantee safety. So the future looks bright for them too. If you look at their wage bill and how they've been able to compete uh, in that league with that wage bill, it shows you, I think, the, uh, the talent we have on the scouting side, on the coaching side, on the management side, to be able to put a team together to not just uh, survive in, uh, in, in the French League, but also compete and be competitive with the best teams in that competition. The structure that we know is already in the pipeline is the new arena on the Etihad campus. What can you tell us about the progress there and, the, and any plans for the campus in general? The arena, the arena is going to be a very important addition to, to our campus and uh, the Etihad Stadium and that whole area. We've been working tirelessly over the years in building up step by step um, the, that area uh, for the community and obviously for our fans. I am um, delighted with the way the arena has been developed. We have a great partnership over there. Uh, work is, you know, you can see it already, the structure is coming up. Uh, once it's ready and, 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 and open, I think on the entertainment side, on the sports side, it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful uh, contributor to our entire campus and to the city of Manchester and to the region, to be honest. Um, we, we, keep, we keep thinking uh, about what to do next and what to do more. This is always uh, the ethos of what we do. Uh, our campus was nothing but a, but a map uh, with some plans uh, many years ago, and we went you know, step by step. Uh, through careful planning, uh, construction, development, and build-up, I'm very proud of uh, of the this this whole um, master plan that we've we've put together over the years, and then the execution and implementation over the years uh, of each block within that master plan. The arena is going to be a, a, is going to be a wonderful success for the for the, for the whole area. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you.